Claire is a social worker, a yoga teacher, and an ordained lay chaplain with a concentration in end-of-life work. She has a private practice with a focus on bereavement and end-of-life concerns, and she is adjunct faculty member at Andover Newton Theological School. <coughs> She, for 15 years, she was a faculty member at the Family Institute of Cambridge, a postgraduate training center where she taught therapeutic writing for clinical practice. As an author, she is currently working on her second book, Right to the Heart of Grief, for those who've lost loved ones, and today she will be talking about her first book, Lasting Words, A Guide to Finding Meaning Toward the Close of Life. I read something that Claire shared with me about her work and her writing, which really has to do with what we all face as humans. What Claire said was, there is a particular way people often open to life as they age and approach our latter years. Seeing the horizon, there is a way that we feel more appreciation and love for what we have, knowing that everything is impermanent. Working at the end of that opening with people is a real privilege. My wish is that people will see their lives as valuable libraries filled with stories, lessons, and wisdom that have value for those that they love. And with that, I would like to introduce to you Claire Willis. I want to just say something about the title of the book. Um, when I hired a publicist, she said to me, why did anybody let you title this book that? It should have been called Lasting Words, A Guide to Finding Meaning as We Grow Older. So those of you that don't consider yourself moving toward the close of life, um, I would just ask you to think about it in, in a larger context, okay? So a legacy. I love this quote by Shannon Alder, carve your name on hearts, not tombstones. A legacy is etched into the minds of others and the stories they share about you. And that's what this is gonna be about this morning. In the next few minutes, what I would hope is that when you leave here today, you see your life a little bit differently and as a gift to pass on to people you love. <clears throat> so just consider for a moment these questions. What do you wish to preserve from your life? and what actions might help you feel more peaceful in the face of death. I mean, even if you're young, it's so easy to think it's not gonna happen to us. Um, none of us actually really believes we're gonna die because it's too much to take on. But stuff happens and I think preparing for death and living for life is a, they're really the same. Um, and then what actions would lead you to feel that your life was complete? A few years ago I was playing tennis and my tennis partner said to me, why are you so out of breath? This isn't a rigorous game. And I said, oh, I don't know. And I didn't think much of it. And I went home, I bicycled home and I got home and I started to walk up the steps and I couldn't get up the steps because I was so short of breath. And I had, my, my lungs were filled with blood clots and I almost died. And my doctor said, you're the last person in my practice I ever would have thought this would happen to because you're so active. So none of us know when this moment's gonna come, but it's worth thinking about because it, if you really believe that your life has a beginning, a middle, and an end, you live it differently. Joan Halifax, who's a well-known Buddhist teacher who wrote the book, Being With Dying, and who read my thesis, this was my thesis for a chaplaincy program, said we should all think about death in the morning and at noon and at night. And not to be morbid, but to make sure we spend the morning in the way we want, we spend the afternoon the way we want, and we spend the evening the way we want. So, <coughs> so basically we all have a lot of wishes in common. We share common wishes as we age and as we get towards the close of life. The obvious one is to feel that we belong and we feel rooted where we are. The, the family and community becomes more and more important as we grow older. And to feel known. Um, when I, some of you were at my um, book reading at the Brookline Booksmith in um, last March and uh, about 130 people came and my children came from New York and Cambridge. And one of them said to me afterwards, we didn't know you could talk in front of people. And I thought, well, why would they know that, really? Because I work in, in private contained settings. I work with people who are 
uh, who have cancer, who are living in chronic disease, and I work with people who are bereaved. And most of our children actually don't know us fully. They know us as parents, and they know how to aggravate us. They know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They know what buttons to push, but do they really know us deeply? And I think, you know, I have two grandchildren that are one. Each one of my daughters has a one-year-old, and their life is about getting enough sleep at night. Their life is not right now about getting to know mom. But when I die, and I noticed this when my, when my mother died, there was an access point in me that wanted to know more about who she was. And I didn't know her fully, and I don't think she actually knew herself well enough to share herself with me. But I don't want my children to feel like they didn't know me. And so I, what I do is I keep a file, for, um, and it's called Death File. And actually, it has all the practical information they need, but it also has stories I want them to remember about me and things that they don't have time to really take in as they're doing their own lives now. So for each of us, I think, in our families, there's an access point when we're not here for who we were, and just to trust that. And then the wish we all share to be remembered. And that's one of the ways we can do that is through a spiritual and ethical will. Most of us feel, want to feel that our life made a difference. That's another common wish and desire we share. And then to feel blessed and to bless. Rachel Raymond talks about blessing someone, in blessing someone we touch their unborn goodness. I think that's so beautiful, beautifully said. Um, in fact, I want to just, uh, I want to just read you a, a lot of people when I say the word blessing, it, it's a loaded word because I think for some people it has a lot of theological implications. I have um, a couple of bereavement groups that I lead, and one of the, um, the members of my group was a young father, and his wife died of cancer and left him with a 10-year-old. And um, she had done most of the parenting, and she said to him, when I die, go over and you'll find a letter for our daughter. And when he went over there, he actually found a letter for himself. And I want to just read you a paragraph out of it, because imagine what it would be like to receive a letter if your partner or spouse died. Let love into your life. Sorry, let new love into your life. I know this will seem impossible for a long time, but at some point I want you to open yourself to the possibility of loving someone else. Falling in love again will in no way dishonor my memory or diminish the love we had for each other. In fact, it would honor our marriage. I mean, imagine being given something like that. Or here's a, another one written by uh, a father to his son, which I think is so lovely. May you always jump for joy at the sight of a snowstorm. May you always scream with excitement at the sound of the word Dairy Queen. <laughs> May you always delight at the feeling of making snow angels in the yard. May you always know how much I love you and how much you've taught me about truly living in the moment. Those are blessings. They're so easy to write. And then lastly, the wish to celebrate our life. And I love what Mary Oliver says, uh, all my life I was a bride married to amazement. So in my book, which is interesting, most people when they read my book, they say, I love the poetry in your book. And so I thought I would just concentrate a little bit about poetry. Mario Como said, and maybe some of you heard this, it was very interesting, he said, I, govern, I campaign with poetry and I govern with prose. And somebody said, what do you mean by that? This was an interview on, on TV. And he said, because poetry lures you in. And I thought that was really profound because I used poetry for each of the chapters in my book and I didn't really know why I was using it except I knew it felt right. And now when people read my book, they say the poetry in the book is so beautiful. It's not mine, it's poetry I purchased as I'm sure you know what that's <coughs> like. So um, it, it gives you a direct knowing and it, it helps to reframe and open the topics in the book in inducting the reader. I think of poetry as kind of a form of induction because it pulls on the other side of the brain. It's not left brain oriented and it allows the issue of aging and illness and death to come in and be thought about and considered with a broader lens. So I, I was reading Kim Rosen's book, Saved by a Poem, which a lot of you probably know, but I loved the idea that poetry is an ancient form of prayer and was a healing medicine used in times of uncertainty. She talks about it as a resource of the heart, um, as money and natural resources dwindle, which I thought was really um, powerful. Um, and then the softening of the habitual left brain process. 
I love that, that we should take poetry in like we absorb a piece of music or art and not talk about what does it mean, but to feel it, really feel it in our body. And then she says it relaxes the inner mind. So these are some of the common concerns as we age. I, what I do is I researched common concerns that people have, the most common concerns at the end of life, and come to, big surprise, come to find out that it's the common concerns we have as we age. So doing a life review was one of them. S expressions of gratitude, and then the idea of maintaining reasonable hope was another. Passing on wisdom and lessons. If I asked each of you to make a list of three instructions you would most want to pass on to people you love, they would most likely be instructions that you, that at some point or another caused you pain. So, for example, one of the things I would most want to say to my children is um, be, be uh, generous. And there's a story behind my wish for that, um, that has actually carries a lot of pain and suffering. And the places where we have wisdom to share are usually the places where we've suffered. And we want to save the people we love from that suffering. And then the question becomes how to pass on instructions that don't sound bossy, <laughs> but change the language. So if I said to my, one of my kids, you've got to be generous, you know what they're going to say, right? But if I said, may you find the joy of giving without having to be known for your gifts, hear the difference? That's a blessing. It's soft language. And then forgiveness. Um, when I work with people, I, I, we each have a list of people we could say I'm sorry to that never, we never said I'm sorry to. So what does it mean to begin to write those letters saying I'm sorry for the time I hurt you? And then prayers become very important, making meaning of what's happening at the end of life, and then the saying goodbye. I don't know whether any of you are familiar with Ellen Goodman and her conversation project, but if you're not, uh, she has a website that is quite something. Um, I lead a lot of bereavement groups, and one of the things that's really painful is when someone dies, when the loved one has to make a decision in the ER or the ICU with not having a clue what their loved one wants, it complicates their grief beyond measure. And, you know, as Ellen says, it's always too early to do this until it's too late. So I think when we assume we have forever, we're really um, going to get ourselves into a lot of trouble and make it difficult for our families. So <clears throat> I just want to say a little bit about this one, ch two chapters actually, on, on life journey. Reflecting on our life and doing a life review is, a, is basically a developmental task of aging as we get older. And what I do in my book is I urge people to think about their life in segments of seven or ten years. Because if I said, tell me about your life, if you're, if you're my age, like if you're 70, you're just like, where do you start, right? But if I said, tell me about from zero to ten, tell me about from ten to twenty, you, when you chunk your life down, you get a lot more memories. So everybody remembers the poem, The Road Not Taken, right? We all have a series of critical turning points where decisions were made and what drove those decisions and who might want to know about what were the guiding principles in some of the decisions you made. One of the really fun exercises I do when I do a writing workshop is I ask people to make a list of all the names they were ever called. Let me tell you, that brings up the most wonderful stories. Uh, it, it, it brings up so many memories that people wouldn't think about otherwise. And then I often ask people to think about the souvenirs and mementos from their life. I was visiting a friend the other day, and uh, she got up to walk across the room, and she tripped on her drum cord, and she broke her hip. And she had to go to rehab for, well, first she had surgery, and then she had to go to rehab for a long time. So one of the things I always ask people is, what are the objects that if you had to go somewhere precipitously would offer you continuity, coherence, and meaning? What would help you make a transition if you had to go abruptly into an assisted living community or you had to go into the hospital for a long time. And it's very interesting to reflect on those things. So the second chapter, that's me and my dog. Um, the second chapter is on gratitude and I want to talk for a couple of minutes about gratitude. Um, gratitude is the one quality that is positively linked to happiness. There's a lot of direct research. What you pay attention to and what you rest your mind on is the primary shaper of your brain and how you experience your life. I mean, just think about that, the amount of agency you have. So 
Our experience of our life is based less on our life per se than what we choose to attend to. That's really profound. And following up, it's when, when um, Cheryl did her introduction, I just couldn't believe she said something about gratitude and resilience. To the extent that we can build gratitude, we are building resilience. So let me just say a little more about that. I don't want to get complicated, but there's a lot of neuroplastic research on the neuroplasticity now of the brain, that the brain has been thought to be much more malleable than we had previously thought. This is good news. The mind is negatively habituated towards what's wrong. We are hardwired that way, and we're hardwired that way because that's how we learn to survive. Um, we survived because we were alert to danger and we were able to keep ourselves safe, sort of survival of the fittest. Unfortunately now, most of us are habituated towards what's negative by um, habit and we don't need to be habituated in the ways that we are. So let's just look at a, a typical day. Our, our attention is like a combination of a spotlight and a vacuum cleaner. It highlights what it lands on, and then it sucks it into your brain. Mm -hmm. That's not my metaphor, it's somebody else's, but I think it's really graphic. So that the mind ends up taking the shape of what it rests on. So if we rest our attention on self-criticism, worries, hurts, distress, the brain gro grows more reactive, vulnerable, we get more prone to more ang anxiety and depression. If we rest on good events, pleasant feelings, favors done, kindnesses, the brain will take on a different shape. So let's think about a typical morning. You get up, you go to the bathroom, you brush your teeth, you maybe make a cup of coffee, you get in your car and you go where you're going. Do you, when you get there, do you say, thank God everything fell in line this morning? No. Our attention is only grabbed when our expectations are broken. Let's think about that. That's really profound. On a morning when the toilet clogs, the coffee maker doesn't work, the electric toothbrush, there's no power or whatever, you might say, what a crappy morning I've had, right? So the mind notices what's wrong. We don't notice what's right. So the mind is like Velcro for what's negative. We don't forget the imprint of the negative experience. We may forget some of the details around it, but we don't forget that it happened. And the mind is like Teflon water over Teflon for positive experiences. They go right through us without noticing. So one of the ways that you can build inner resilience, and we all need to build resilience, because as we get older, our lives often don't get easier, and build resilience to suffering that is inevitable, is to linger for 10 to 30 seconds when you notice something that's right. So when you go out and you see that someone's shoveled your car out, Really take that in. Let that absorb in your body, in your mind for 10 to 30 seconds. So we're not ever, we're not ever denying what's wrong, but we are noticing what's right along with what's wrong. I teach yoga. If I have 20 people in my class and I get 19 positive evaluations and I get one negative, guess where my attention goes, right? So we, we resonate to this because we're all like that. And by just beginning to notice what's right more of the time, you will, you will first of all, you'll be happier. <laughs> and secondly, you'll be more resilient for what's coming down the road. It's really the most important practice I think you can offer yourself. So what I'd like to do just, um, I think I just have a couple more minutes. Cheryl, is that right? Five. Five, okay. Um, I'm not going to go through all the chapters in the book. My, my favorite chapter is the chapter on gratitude. But what I'd like to do is just read a couple of poems that are attached to some of these chapters, because I, some of them I don't think are probably poems you know. This one was written by a friend of mine named Mary Chivers, and it's called Late August. And it, it really embodies for me the work of my book um, to help people close their life with coherence and meaning, and when the end comes, to feel they're ready for it. I mean, that's... That's really something. So this poem is called Late August. It's as if we're always preparing for something, the endless roll of the earth ripening us. Even on the most tranquil late August afternoon, when heavy heads of flocks bow in the garden and the hummingbird sits still for a moment on a branch of an apple tree, even on such a day, evening approaches sooner than yesterday. And we cannot help noticing whole families of birds arrive together in the enclosure. 
Young blue birds molted a misty gray, colored through no will of their own for a journey. On such an evening, I ache for what I cannot keep, the birds, the flocks, the late flying bees, though I would not forbid the frost, even if I could. There will be more to love and lose in what's to come, and this too, desire to see it clear before it's gone. Do you all know the, the poem Hope and Love by Jane Hirschfield? I can't see. What am I, I don't know why I'm asking. I can't see. I'm gonna re this one's in the chapter on hope, and I think this is so beautiful. All winter, the blue heron slept among the horses. I do not know the custom of herons, do not know if the solitary habit is their way, or if he listened for some missing one, not knowing even that was what he did in the blowing sounds in the dark. I know that hope is the hardest love we carry. He slept with his long neck folded like a letter put away. This is the last one I'll read because I, this one you won't know either, but I love this. This is in the chapter on forgiveness. It's called The Bodies of Grown-Ups. The bodies of grown-ups come with stretch marks and scars, faces that have been lived in, relaxed breasts and bellies, backs that give trouble, and well-worn feet, flesh that is particular and obviously mortal. They also come with bruises on their heart, wounds they can't forget, and each of them a company, in, a company of lovers in their soul who will not return and cannot be erased. And yet I think there is a flood of beauty beyond the smoothness of youth, and my heart aches for that grace of longing that flows through bodies, no longer straining to be innocent, but yearning for redemption. So I just want to close with a very short paragraph by Atul Gawande, who um, some of you may know his work. Um, he wrote a book that's at the top of the bestseller list right now called Being Mortal. And if you haven't read it, read it. He's, um, he's a Boston surgeon. And he talks a lot about the role of dying, the dying role. And I love what he says. Technological society has forgotten what, sc what scholars call the dying role and its importance to people as life approaches its end. People want to share memories, pass on wisdom and keepsakes, settle relationships, establish their legacies, make peace with God, and ensure that those who are left behind will be okay. They want to end their stories on their own terms. This role is among life's most important for both the dying and for those left behind. Thank you. So many years I lost count long ago since we could look into each other's eyes without you forcing some funny face. The truth lay on that broken line of sight directed like some painful joke, and funny was a dam, weak against our tears. Better for you to intercept eye contact with your magazine and proclaim with full sincerity that you were listening. Two red-tailed hawks ride a thermal above our cul-de-sac. Gray underbelly, spangled black. They appear a matched set, indistinguishable from this earthbound angle. Though neither of us here below can claim with any truth to know their story, we nevertheless stand with shaded gaze and wrestle an ancient anthropomorphic longing to read within their circumscribed pattern of part, real, reunite, an aerial pas de deux, a waltz of breeze and wingspan. The idealiz idealization of this occasion on the downslope side of a cold, cold season. Ah, to cast reason to the wind and give full sway to folly. To pretend we believe they are in love. 
pretend just for today that they are as we did once dream to be, enraptured, forever dancing. Thank you. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Bitter, raw, and completely silent. Absent and present at the same time. So airless I can't find a breath. The propane delivery man says it's nothing compared to Wyoming where he's just come from. Came back to New England for a woman, he says, while relighting the pilot gone out from burning everything in the tank. Says that our idea that people are nicer out west is just a matter of a per capita. <laughs> You'll find just as many jerks, just more spread out. <laughs> Simone, who cleans my house, has only seen two winters outside of Brazil. She doesn't mind the cold as much as the snow. I can put layers on to stay warm, but can't get out of the snow when I stuck. She says, that is bad. I used to love a good snowman in a sled. Childhood illusions for sure. The snowman has frostbite. <laughs> Just one thing on my bucket list, to feel your hand, to hear your voice when it's time to face the dark. Thank you. Snow does have sound, like a blossom opening in the sun. It can only be perceived by the heart, not by the ear and the sound of the sunrise is equally loud, a symphony, a bursting of song which can fill the heart with joy, like a newborn child. Thank you. Peach and pear. 